What's up, family? Welcome to another episode of Next Gen Fridays. And you're with your host, your gracious host, the one with the most, Mr. Often Imitated But Can't Be Duplicated, a.k.a. Mr. Can't Stop, Won't Stop, with a Diddy Bop, a.k.a. Mr. Feed Me Burgers, a.k.a. I just had a peanut butter and jelly ice cream, which is pretty, pretty dope. And it's your one and only Chris Latham, and I'm here today with Nyla Malou, a very special guest to Next Gen Fridays. Nyla, say what up to the family. Hello. Now, Nyla, before we begin, I've been batting 100% right now. I've been doing two episodes in a row. How old are you? I'm 15. Okay, so heads up, family. We're about to dive into a very special episode. We got a 15-year-old who is, one, an author, two books, not just one book, physical books, not just e-books. We have a 15-year-old who's also into STEM. So that is science, technology, engineering, and math, for people that don't know. We have a 15-year-old who's also a consultant. And, yeah, all this within the age of 15. So, Nyla, before we dive into all the cool stuff you've been up to, just tell us a bit about what you've been up to and what you're doing right now. Yeah. Um, so, I'm a 15-year-old just really passionate about making a difference, specifically in the sustainability field. Um and so this year I did a lot within energy, um, and I delved pretty deeply into solar energy, and I designed a transparent and flexible solar cell using nanomaterials, which I'm now working on building out in a lab. And now I'm shifting my research toward bioplastics and trying to use sugar kelp to make an inexpensive um, but very effective PLA bioplastic that could replace every single-use plastic today. Uh, and then I also love to write. So right now I'm working on a sequel to my novel that was released a few months ago, as well as a children's book series on emerging technology. So yes, happy to be here. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, that was a mouthful. We're going to have to break this down <laughs> by <a> bit. <laughs> All right. So first things first, What I, before we dive into the solar energy, the creating a new version of PLA and you being an author, Clearly, there's a lot of drive. You have a lot of passions. You clearly have that sense of, you know, if you like something and you're curious about it, go and get it. So I'm curious to know is, was this something that was always in you from like day one when you were born? Or is this something that you realize you've learned by watching family? Where did this drive and motivation and focus come from? Yeah, I think it was like instilled in me from a pretty young age. Um, just like go and do whatever makes you happy, but also helps others, you know, like try and do something meaningful with your life. Um, and so from a young age, that's like what I was trying to do, just like, you know, seeing what I was interested in, you know, at the age of five, I wanted to be a dancer, singer, artist, doctor, and lawyer all at the same time. I was like, I'm going to do that. It's going to be good. It's going to be meaningful. Um, you know, still don't know what I want to do when I'm older. You know, I think uh, my five-year-old self had my jobs figured it out, figured out for me, you know, um, more than I do now. But uh, I'm just working on different projects, maybe not to get like to a specific job because I don't really have a specific job in mind. Right now, I'm just following my curiosity, building as many projects as I can, uh, you know, exposing myself to different technologies, different aspects of STEM, because uh, that's just very, very interesting to me. Um, and, you know, just just kind of just kind of going for it. So, yeah, that can definitely be credited to the environment that I grew up in, my parents, my friends. I'm very lucky. Yeah. All right, so I definitely got to dive into that because at five year old self had seemed to have much more creative artistic expressions with dance and singing. I wanted to be and <laughs> <laughs> and your current self is definitely more into things that I'm not going to say are not as creative, but they're creative, but there are boundaries because there are rules that have to be applied for certain things. There are certain <laughs> laws in science and physics, yeah. but you're still creative in the sense you get to create something new and different. So I'm curious to know because you mentioned your environment. Where is the difference where most people at 15 were either thinking about like boys, movie, music, and this and that, and your passion geared towards science? Like, was it a sort of thing as a young age, your parents gave you like a, micro, a stethoscope or they just didn't have like balls and toys in the house? They just gave you like, read this science book real quick oh as a punishment. <laughs> um, yeah, I, again, it just goes back like to the environment. I definitely wasn't always just like, a, you know, science book when I was younger. I I read a lot, though, um, and I just enjoyed reading about different kinds of things like fiction, fantasy, you know, dystopian. I really love reading, and I feel like that taught me a lot. Reading just makes you smarter, and so that was amazing. And then something that happened this year, so I, in September, I joined this program called the Knowledge Society, and I think that's what got me to actually act on my interest in STEM because... Before this, I knew I was interested in STEM, but I wasn't really building projects. Uh, but when I entered this year, like, they pushed you. They said, like, 
find something you're interested in and go deep. Like, get a technical depth, not, like, for a kid, but for, like, an expert. Gain a, a degree of expertise in a field that you are passionate about. And so I took energy, I took solar energy, and I said, like, let's run with it. Just go for it, build a project, because uh, that's where you learn the most, by building. Um, and so I think those kinds of projects can heavily be credited to the Knowledge Society um, and just the mentorship that they provide. That has been incredibly, incredibly helpful for me. I'm loving the sound of this Knowledge Society because yeah. what I'm getting here is that they've created an environment where kids and people could just dive into whatever curiosity they have, but also giving the heads up, like, look, as life goes on, you need to kind of specialize in one thing or like be the expert in one thing and dabble in others, but you can't keep bouncing around from ideas to ideas. And I know that for a lot of people that are your age, my age and older, we tend to start something, not finish it, start something, not finish it. So I'm curious to know, was the fact that was the Knowledge Society the place or the thing that forced you to keep driving down onto one thing, even though whenever you lost motivation, or where did you just say something, just something innate within you and the family that once you pick that one thing, we're like pit bulls, we're going all in? Yeah, so, well, I think, like, the Knowledge Society definitely helped with it, and maybe, maybe in, like, a combination of the two, but basically how the Knowledge Society works, a big part of it is, like, you do focuses, um, and so you choose a topic, um, and you just go really deep into it, like, you write articles, you produce content, you reach out to experts, you build, like, a project, um, and so that's what makes you run with it, because you do... I don't know, like one to two a year probably. So I did two this year. Um, one was actually in fusion and then one was more within like nanotech and solar energy. Um, and it really shows you like when you commit to something, like keep going with it. You know, don't let it just be like, I'm going to do it. And then you just don't do it. You know, you have to actually block out time for it um, if it's something that means something to you. Uh, and so I definitely learned that this year and it wasn't always easy. So with Infusion. I had this idea for like these toroidal field coils, which are a part of a fusion reactor, and I wanted to redesign them using graphene. Hold on, there, Nyla. Hold on. You're gonna have to repeat that oh and explain God. that to me like I'm five years oh, old. Oh, sorry. Please. It's just like this, this <laughs> very specific part of a fusion reactor, and I wanted to redesign it basically to just boost the efficiency of a fusion reactor. And I was like, okay, let me use graphene. Um, this this carbon-based nanomaterial is gonna be great. And I ran it by these experts. They were like, Have you considered this? Have you considered this? Have you considered this? This. Um, and honestly, it was so out of my scope. It was really challenging, and I had to pivot, but it's important that when you stick to something, you don't just leave it behind, which maybe I was a little tempted to do, but I'm really glad that I still ran with it, and that was a, a big a big challenge for me this year. But um, I'm glad I did, and I actually ended up pivoting to space exploration with Fusion. Um, and so I, I designed this Fusion-propelled spacecraft that had like these solar sail extensions, uh, and I ended up learning about a different industry. So it's not so much as like stick with one field forever and like don't don't, don't go out of it. Um, it's it's great to have. It's just great to have a depth in a numerous amounts of fields where you have built projects because that allows you to make intersections. So if you have one person within fusion energy, for example, like that, that's really great. But then what if you also have a toolkit in nanotechnology and you also have a toolkit in artificial intelligence? Suddenly you can kind of create this web and you have these really unique ideas. Uh, and so it's just all about gaining a degree of expertise in a range of fields. I love that. And that, in gaining a range of expertise in a different range of fields, that the first thing that comes to mind is the quote, jack of all trades, master of none. And the thing is, the full quote of that is, jack of all trades, master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. And I think the part where people seem to get a misunderstanding is that you being great at man more than one thing isn't a bad thing. Because again, it's like you mentioned, you're going to be able to bring your perspective from each particular thing that you're good at and bring it all together to bring a different point of view and different perspective to the task you're working on. Meanwhile, that person who specializes in just one particular thing, and that's the only thing they're good at, they only have one lens to look at that problem or solution they're trying to figure out. But if you could have different lenses to put on to, to look at the same problem, you could come up with different solutions that someone else who's an expert in that one field would have never thought of. Exactly. So I'm loving the fact that you were able to essentially pivot you just chose one road to go down and then halfway down, you realize, you know what, I'm a little interested in this too. And I'm going to pivot that way. But people got to realize these pivots doesn't bring you backwards. Mm -hmm. You're still propelling forward because the end goal 
is something much, much bigger that, that will not be achieved today or tomorrow or next year. This will take years and years in accumulation. And obviously what's happening is everything you're doing now builds you to becoming the expert of that thing when that time comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about, God, her speechless. All about calm down. Like, <laughs> yeah. God, her speechless. <laughs> I'm loving that. So one thing I definitely want to chat about, and one thing I'm for sure curious about is looking over looking over the sheet of paper and seeing your name, what you've accomplished. People are gonna say it's very impressive. Why aren't more kids like this? Why aren't my why is my daughter and my son to the same thing? And the part of me that I look at this is it's weird how society will take someone in your position who's into STEM, into science and research and nanotechnology, like, you know what, she's doing amazing things. Next person to look out for in the world is going to do wonderful things and like be, ends up being put as on a pedestal as a role model. And essentially all I'm understanding from your story is, was, look, I'm just interested in this stuff and anything I'm interested in, I'm diving in 100 percent. in. So my thing is, it's interesting how when it comes to your story, just do because you're, the subject matter you picked is very rare for someone of your age to pick. Makes you society will deem you as a better role model than someone else who's who's into either art, dance, music, creating a business, or just anything else really. But it's that same drive and focus that both people will have. How do you feel about society kind of shedding more light onto you with what your interests are versus someone else and their interests are, and you're both putting in the same amount of work? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, there definitely are. Like, a lot of narratives in society where one thing is better than another thing, and yet, like, maybe it's bringing the same amount of meaning to, to you and other people. Um, and so I think it's important uh, to, to recognize that, for, for sure. Like, um, I, I think, um, let, me, let me phrase this, let me phrase this correctly. Uh, I, I, I think that, can we re-record this part? This is bad. Oh yeah, no problem. I... This is bad. Sorry. Magic of editing. <laughs> okay. um, yes, I think society has placed different narratives around different areas of jobs. So, for example, someone working in technology may be placed higher than an artist, even though what they're doing is incredible as well. And so, it's always important to keep that in mind. And in terms of people putting in the same work. Hard work does not always equate to the same outcome. So for me, I'm just incredibly lucky. Um, in the position that I am in, like, luck has played a huge role. Getting to live in Canada, getting to have access to a laptop, you know, um, having the parents that I do, having a roof over my head, being able to go to school. A lot of people don't have these privileges. Uh, and that's often not recognized either. And so it, it's always important to recognize that there are a lot of social stigmas. There are a lot of factors that aren't really considered when you view somebody's resume. Uh, and so it's always important to, to look at all of these different things and realize what society deems as important should not deem what you view as important. Always. That, that, that's a gem right there. That ended on a high note. Kaplow! <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And that is, that's honestly, that's, that's the truth. Cause it's, I find a lot of people will force themselves in situations that I'm going to do what society says is best or what society glorifies. Although I'm miserable and I hate it. I'm going to do this cause I'm going to get the recognition and the clout. Exactly. When in reality, if you're much happier doing something else and granted, yes, we all need to be able to put a roof over our head, feed ourselves. I'm not saying go do some sort of career where you can't feed yourself. But like if you could find a balance in, either having something that you enjoy doing as a passion project to kind of give you that balance versus doing a job that you hate, but like it gives you that clout, makes you feel good about yourself. That would be the best situation where you could get a win-win. But if you're lucky enough, like you mentioned, and privileged enough to be in a situation where what you're generally interested in, what you want to spend time learning about, are things society puts on a pedestal and seems like, oh, this person is the next great wonder in the world. Eh, that's a win-win. But also the fact that you're aware and you're conscious enough to realize like, yeah, I am in a lucky position. Sure. If I was born in a different country, I may not have had these opportunities. And like many of my peers have the exact same opportunities. When I'm diving in, I'm diving all the way in head first and I'm burning the boat. There's no going back. I'm making it to that end destination. I knew I am trying to get to. So I think also it could be easier. People could either say you're lucky, but at the same time, there are 30, 50, hundreds of other girls in the same position as you that didn't act on things. Right. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of people, do things just because that's what they want, just 
because that's what's expected of them. Um, and a lot of people just go after money, for example. They go after these high-paying jobs, even if it's not meaningful to you. And if you're putting your entire life toward it, you want it to be meaningful to you. You want it to bring you joy. Um, and, and people just don't take that into consideration. They think, like, I have a nice car. I have a big house. Like, this is all I need. But materialism isn't going to buy you happiness. Uh, and so do what actually brings you meaning, not what brings society meaning and what they deem as a meaningful job. Uh, because a lot of people make that mistake and um, sometimes it can just be wasted potential. Like you can go and do something um, that just feels more fulfilling. I think fulfillment is, is really key. That's true. That is true. At the same time, it's what I find interesting is interviewing many people under the age of 26, I'm seeing a recurring theme in I want to find a career path that fulfills me. And also, like, yeah, we all want to make sure we get enough money to put a roof over our head. For all those saying, yeah, you can work and you can start painting the sidewalk if you want. Like, no, like, we obviously have common sense that we want to find some sort of passion that we want to do that also fulfills us and puts a roof over our head and has some money in our pocket. And at the same time, I can hear the other generation saying, yeah, you guys are being naive. The world doesn't kind of work like that. And the part that I'm finding interesting is that the older folks that are coming in saying that you guys are naive for thinking such, they're the same folks that I that I believe the young generation looked at and realized you're actually miserable. Like you're not happy with what you're doing. Like why would I want to follow the same path you're telling me to go down and live the same misery you're living? So it's almost like the next generation coming up has seen the end outcome of like that's not what happiness is. If that's what that's leading to, I'm going to create a different path for myself. And I do believe that the situation we're in now with all the technology and the internet booming up and everything grow, go, growing and building at a faster pace there are more opportunities now for the generation such as yourself and the generation coming up behind you. So I'm curious, has there ever been a situation where either any doubt has creeped in in the path you want to take or any situation where you're like, you know what, this is fully it. There's no doubt. hundred percent. This can bring me happiness. I'm going to find balance and it's all going to work out. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of your, the second part where like everything's going to work out, like this is bring me exactly where I want to be. I don't really know where I want to be. Um, like, I don't really know. Like, again, I'm not really working toward getting a specific job, for example. Really no clue um, what, what the future is going to hold. It's just like, if something that I'm doing is bringing me fulfillment, is bringing me joy, I just have a lot of fun doing it. Like, right now, um, before this, I was doing some research into macroalgae, and I was like, this is so freaking cool. Like, this is just so cool, and I'm just so excited that I get to delve deeper into this. Um, but, I mean, that's not how it always is, for sure. Um, like, building a project, when you say that, it sounds easier than actually building a project, because you're coming up with something new. Um, and so that that can be hard. And when I was starting out my work, like, in bioplastics, I was like, I don't know. I was like, I want to make a better bioplastic. How am I going to do that? I have zero clue. Um, but as long as you are like in love with the problem, um, then I think the outcome will, will mean something to you. And so it's important not to fall in love with like, oh, if I do this, I'm going to be like famous. You know, I'm going to get this attention, like actually have fun with the process. Uh, because again, if you're putting so much time toward this, uh, you want it to be something you enjoy. And then in, in terms of like the first thing you asked, um, so is there any time where I was, where doubt creep, where doubt crept in? For sure within technology, like my technological projects where I'm like, what am I doing? Uh, for example, the fusion thing when it just kept getting, uh, kind of, beaten down by these experts who were like, this is not going to work. I was like, oh my God, I put so much research into this. Uh, that Those were definitely times where doubt crept in, but again, I really loved the actual problem, so I kept going. And then putting a little spin on it, in terms of writing, actually, there was a lot of doubt there as well. Um, because before my book that got published, I had written another book and it had just gotten mass rejected by agents and publishing houses. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I reached out to 100 and none of them said yes. Like how, how am I going to go back to this and potentially just get rejected all over again? Um, and so I was like, you know, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should stop. But there was something greater inside me that said, you know, you really enjoy this. Uh, you really want to get a book published. So just go, just go do it. You know, just push, um, get that motivation and just go for it. And that's, that's how I publish a book. So usually things that are really meaningful and substantial in your life, the journey's not going to be always easy, but make sure that as a whole, you enjoy it. 1000%. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think that is a part people miss out on is, yes, the journey is going to be hard. It's going to be long. It's going to be challenging. But like I said, if you're in love with the outcome or the goal or just the journey or the mission of why you're doing what you're doing and in love with the purpose, there's the journey could take five, 10 years. You're still going to be happy because you're enjoying why you're doing what you're doing it for. And I think that's the part that a lot of people miss out on in that they just do things, as you mentioned, for the outcome and with the clout and the, the, the how famous they could get from doing X, Y, and Z. But at the same time, those that have a longer career and actually do make big change in life in the world are doing because like yeah i'm just doing because i really enjoy this and this just just makes sense and like the same way like I, I love how you mentioned that you're working on changing pla plastics i'm really curious about that because that's pla is not the greatest thing to be recycled yeah yeah so <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious how did you get not how did you what what navigated you towards saying you know what i'll make a change to this plastic yeah um so I think I was like on my LinkedIn and there was this there's this like article on plastic pollution and I I'd, I'd obviously heard about plastic pollution like this humongous problem but I went through the article and then there was a little bit about bioplastics and like learn more you know at this page and so I went to it um and I read this article about bioplastics and I was like this is so freaking cool and there is a major gap in this market because the problem with bioplastics today um a lot of them are greenwashed, uh, like PLA some of the time is a greenwash where it's like, it's great for the environment. You hear bio, um, you hear like biodegradable and you think, wow, this is great for the environment, but it is not always. And sometimes bioplastics only biodegrade under these really, really, really specific conditions, uh, that they just ultimately do not get. And so they end up in the ocean like every other plastic and it has the same outcomes. Like animals still eat them, you know, uh, they still die. And so I was like, what if I could just create a better bioplastic? What if I could create something that is just as cheap as the plastics we use today and actually, actually biodegradable, actually, you know, good for the environment? Um, you know, there are some really great bioplastics out there, but another huge, huge factor that is a barrier is a cost. Uh, it's just so expensive to to create these bioplastics. And so I wanted to address that as well. And then another thing is it's not the most sustainable in the sense that mainly bioplastics use crops and that's cutting into our food supply. It's cutting into arable land. Mm. Um, and, you know, 100 years down the line, we're not going to be able to be creating all of our plastic from the crops. Uh, already, climate change is diminishing our food supply. So I then came across algae. And algae is something that can grow in all these different conditions. It could have all these incredible impacts, actually really boost the efficiency of these bioplastics. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh. And the only barrier, again, is cost. So that's why I'm looking into a specific type of macroalgae called sugar kelp. And I'm looking at cultivation and potentially a <coughs> microbe that you could use to really boost that efficiency of um, getting all the sugars out and then creating a PLA from that. And so it, I, it's it's a pretty new project, to be honest, but it's really, really interesting. It's so fun to learn about. And so we will see. We will see where it takes me. Yeah. <laughs> that is dope. Because, like, with microalgae, that could grow any and everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Like, there's enough water in the world to grow, a ton of, <laughs> to, to grow a ton of algae. And I'm curious. Like, I'm not sure if you figured out the solution to that yet, but is the process in separating the sugars... Is it a process that's going to be a brand new thing or is it already something that's out there that just needs to be adjusted? Yeah, so I don't really know. I feel like I actually have came across some really cool papers where these ideas have been created to optimize macroalgae for bioplastics. And I was like, why isn't this commercialized? And so what I do is I reach out to like the researchers and the people who created that. And since this is new, I'm still like going on these calls. So I have a call with someone who designed such a cool microbe um, that can like be inserted into these bioplastics. And I was like, or sorry, not bioplastics, like the, the algae. Um, and I was like, that is so cool. So I'm looking at these inventions and I'm saying like, is there any way um, that we could use a pre-existing solution where there was some barrier, you know, break down that barrier and then actually use it. Um, and 
maybe it'll be building onto that by creating a new technology, maybe taking something, um, you know, adjusting something and then making it better. We will see. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but again, still very much in, in baby phases here. <laughs> okay, so still many, lots of hypotheses mm -hmm. to come and a lot of testing to come. Yeah, for sure. That is dope. That, that, I gotta say, if you could figure that out and have plastic that's easily biodegradable, that's like really biodegradable. Would be good. <laughs> we're gonna be in a winning situation. Yeah. We may get an extra hundred years on this planet after yeah, all. Yeah. Valuable yeah. time. <laughs> so now I wanna dive into you as an author. So I love the fact that you mentioned how you tried hundreds of times your first book. <laughs> Denied. No entrance. Hard no hard go. Hard. No love coming your no. way. And you're like, you know what? I actually enjoy writing. I'm going to do this again. So I'm curious to know is, was the, f what would you say is the reason your first book didn't get any love versus the second book getting love? Um, honestly, now looking back at my first book, it was just a lot more poorly written. Um, and just by like <laughs> writing another book and going through editing all over again, my writing had really improved over those like three years. Um, and so now I understand why it was rejected to any agents or publishing houses listening. I understand. Um, and also my query letter that I read out was not the best. And I did mention my age, which was not good because people... What's a query letter? Um, it's just like what you use to reach out to agents and publishing houses. And I put that I was like 12 in it, and I don't really think people appreciated that very much. So um, that was another another downfall, but honestly, it was most likely just the quality of the manuscript, just not being there. It wasn't there. Um, but yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad that I did it, and I'm glad that I wrote another book after that. It was a good, good time. I love that. I love that. And I love how you were able to be, I want to be honest with yourself. Like, look, I'll be honest. My last book was crap. It wasn't that good. Now that I look back and I'm like, I'm happy that I was naive enough to think it was going to get yeah, it done because like, it I led really me to that. the point you're at now. It's like, man, this is the bomb right here. It's a great book. They're going to love right. this. <laughs> so I'm curious now because you have your new book, The Chronicles of Illusions, The Blue Wild. Yeah. So I'm curious. It's a fiction book. Where... Did the concept and idea of writing the book come from? Yeah. Um, so I've always really, really loved to write. Um, like, I've been writing novels, like, from a young age. They were bad, yes, but I still really enjoyed it. Um, and also just, like, short stories, things like that. And so the idea for this book... Um, it actually came from stories and books I'd written when I was younger. Uh, so, for example, so my book is these girls traveling through these ancient chronicles, these three ancient chronicles to retrieve artifacts. Um, and so I had to create, like, an entirely new world in each of these chronicles. Um, and every single theme came from a book or a story I'd written when I was, like, in junior school. Um, and so that's actually, that's where everything stemmed from. Um, I had written this this book about, it was called, like, The Fairy Tale World, and it was all about, um, you know, fairy tale characters, not what they seem, and I actually took that, I took that core idea, and I incorporated it, um, and I ended up really liking it. So, yeah, um, you know, draw inspiration from the past, and I also love notebooking, just, like, carry around a little notebook wherever I go, whenever I see any anything interesting, I jot it down. And that usually sparks some ideas for me as well. Uh, and so kind of a combination of those is what gave me the, the general scope of my novel. That is dope. <laughs> that is dope. And I like how you went back to the old stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, this, this could work. Like, let me just kind of slide this 300 yeah, se like, sentences this right really here. Boom. badly written. But you know, you know, the idea is there. The idea was there, Nyla. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So now, when it came down to getting that book out, so um, all this the experience was different. You had an editor in place this time around, someone to proofread it. And when it came to the launch, what was that experience like launching? Well, it's technically your second book, but we'll say your first book. Well, yeah. What was that experience like launching a book? Yeah, well, it was like my first novel because the other one was like a short story that I got published in an anthology. So it was more like a collection of stories or like other authors. This was my first like soul solely written book um and in terms of the launch it was it was really exciting i'd been looking forward to that day for for quite a while and i did like a little bit of, of marketing things uh because the publisher did get it into 
you know, UK bookstores, because that's where they were based, and a few Canadian bookstores, but I had to get it into a few as well, so I was, like, calling up bookstores, I was like, hey, can you, like, put this in your index, can you, like, order a few copies to your store, um, you know, like, posting on social media, things like that, uh, just trying to get, just trying to get the word out in general, but, it felt a little bit surreal the day that it came out, uh, and then I remember, like, holding my book, and I was like, oh my god, this is crazy, this is crazy, uh, because I had been hoping for that for a really long time. I had a goal of getting my own novel published since I was really young, and I learned how to read. I was like, this is cool. Books are really cool. Let me let me do it myself, uh, and so, yeah, just, just surreal. Surreal would describe it, I think. <laughs> All right, all right. So I, I got to tap your brain on this a bit because I have a goal at forty-five to write my first book. Amazing. Other than obviously getting a, a writer, <laughs> a, an editor, <laughs> to go over my stuff. Any advice you'd give for someone who's thinking, you know what, I want to write a book? What what advice would you offer to someone? Like top three things they need to know when it comes to getting a book published. Okay. Yes. So the first thing I would say is notebooking. Um, notebooking, I just mentioned it. It's something I love to do. It's like a small notebook, you know? You can buy from Dollarama. It can be a $2 notebook. Uh, just something you can carry around with you in a little bag. Um, and whenever you see something interesting, it could be like a rose in the middle of a street because that could have a story behind it. It could be someone's really interesting outfit, just jotting it down. Um, and then when you like are looking through that notebook, so many ideas just come to life. So I write my books during the summer, um, and I kind of draw inspiration, do some editing over the year. And so over the year is when I'll do like all my notebooking. And then in the summer, I'll open up my notebook and there will be all these things. And I'll just come up with so many ideas, uh, because there are so many concepts on my page. So that is one thing. Um, the second thing that I would say, um, is making sure that what you're writing, like you love it. You love writing for the sake of writing and you realize that it's not always going to be an easy journey because it is something that you put a lot of time into um and so you want to make sure that you're actually doing this for the right reasons you're doing it because um it's bringing you meaning um and like time managing is really important so you should be making time for your book in your life because again it does take time and so maybe that's like Every morning, I'm going to wake up at 7 a.m. and I'm going to work on my book for one hour. Uh, if you don't block out time for your book, it's not going to get done. Um, and so just, I would always say, like, keep that into consideration um, and make sure that you are giving your manuscript the time and attention that it needs because it needs a lot and then the last thing that i would say is having perseverance it sounds a little bit cheesy uh but again not an easy journey it's pretty long um but if you thoroughly enjoy it and you enjoy what you're doing uh when you see those rejections it's not going to be easy and you know you might want to stop but just like keep going keep going remember why you're doing this um and and have have that motivation to to get past to get past that barrier because sometimes uh people get really into something and then there's that block you know things get hard and they just stop immediately but you need to get past that get past that block uh because that's when the amazing things start to happen so having perseverance is a tip i always give writers thank you and that is that is very true, and I'm seeing a common theme throughout your entire journey and story so far is a lot of it comes down to having resilience. And a lot of it also, well, it's having resilience paired with having a passion for what you're working on and what you're doing. Because without those two, no one's ever going to get anything done. Like if we think of authors, for example, J.K. Rowling got rejected tons of times before Harry Potter came out. Exactly. If she didn't have the love and passion to write in that book and the perseverance and resilience to keep going and going, we would never have fans that are crazy about Harry Potter, like the Harry Potter land, like Harry Potter memorabilia. Harry, there wouldn't be Harry Potter underwears and socks okay. out there in the world right now. Imagine that type of world. <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely something I'm seeing coming time and time again. And is the resilience something that just came over? I'll, put, I'll, raise, I'll rephrase it this way. Would you say the resilience came from you having such love and passion for what you're doing? Or was the resilience something that's been taught to you by your parents by not forcing, but like reminding you to keep doing what you're doing and follow through and finish what you're starting? Yeah, probably a mixture of both. Um, like definitely just 
the morals that I've been taught, like, keep going, like, have perseverance in general as a whole, um, with whatever you're doing when things get hard, like, keep going, that had always been, um, you know, something that I'd been taught, but when it comes to actually doing something, you need to have your own, like, love and your passion for that, uh, and so that was probably the, the bigger part, just loving writing so, so much, um, and knowing that I wanted to get a book published so badly that, like, it was okay. It was okay if a few rejections came through, if some, um, if some things didn't work out, that was okay. I just really enjoyed it. Um, it didn't really feel like work when I wrote. It felt like an outlet for me, um, and so it was something that had always been really enjoyable, uh, and that's, that's what kept me going. I like that. I like that you mentioned they felt like an outlet. Yeah. And just when you said that, I just got the immediate thought of how with everything else you're doing that is so very technical, it's to the minute details, like things got to be on point 100% yeah. of the time. The writing of the book is the one way you've tapped into that creative outlet that the five-year-old you wanted through other <laughs> means or other expressions. And I'm realizing that you're having that balance in which Throughout the year, you kind of jot things down. During the summer, you, you do the notebooking in the summer, put all the ideas down. And then throughout the, and you write it during the summer, and then throughout the year, you kind of edit it. So I find that it's almost like an escape from the world of science and technology. Like you just kind of go into this fantasy world and just like disconnect for a bit and find that balance. Was that something that would you say was not staged, was you put into place by choice? Or as we say in French, c'est par hasard. It just so happened. It <laughs> just kind of happened. I mean, I I love writing before um, doing these STEM projects. So that was something I knew I wanted to be an author from a very young age, uh, and it always felt like an outlet to me. And then when I started getting into technology, I I kept the balance. I still kept writing. I wasn't like one or the other, but writing is definitely a nice way to just like get out of everything and just be just with my just with a blank piece of paper you can write whatever you want you can create you know whatever creatures you want whatever world it's just so nice i've always loved the concept of writing it's so vibey and relaxing to me um and so i think definitely definitely a nice a nice balance between technical technical uh work and also like the creative arts yeah. i love that and like you said a blank piece of paper there's no limits to the world you could create when you're writing yeah Exactly. And no there's balance. no boundaries. No rules. No, just no rules. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> create what you want. Create the rules you want. Yeah. No one can no say it's nonsense. Just call it fiction and like it is what it is. Yeah, that's why I love writing <laughs> fantasy because you can use magic and so you can do whatever you want because it's magic. So I don't need no budget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. So now you have a million and one tasks going on. And we could dive into a whole episode of productivity, time management, so on and so forth, but I don't want to do that because that'll be a whole different rabbit hole we're never going to get out of. We'll be going back and forth sharing tips and ideas. What I want to know is what was the hardest thing in time management for you to implement? Mm, that's a good question. You know, next gen Fridays, we don't ask the basic <laughs> regular questions. We dive in deep and ask those special questions that make you think, that make you ponder, yeah. that puts you in a questionable position like, hmm. hmm. Yeah, I think it was like getting past procrastination because you can say you want to do a bunch of tasks, but you need to make sure that you are disciplined. Things aren't going to happen if you don't have discipline. And so developing the discipline and uh, the motivation to be able to actually go and crush your goals is what's really important because every night before I go to sleep, I will always write down my goals for the next day. And that's great, but to make sure that you are hitting them, you need to make sure that what you're doing is in an efficient manner. So you can say, like, I want to hit these 30 goals tomorrow. I'm going to just do it all. I don't really know how. I'm just going to do it guess what? It's probably not going to happen. Um, and so you need to actually be like, be like honest with yourself. Like, can you do all this? <laughs> and, um, also like incorporate rest and how can you make sure that you do all this? And so, you know, getting rid of social media when you're working, getting away from distractions, making sure that you're not opening up your mail just to, just to respond to a few things. Uh, just being fully fully in the moment um, is very important. It's all about being intentional. Uh, and being intentional was the biggest challenge I had to get past. B 
because being intentional is key to hitting your goal. Yeah, and being intentional is work. Like people think it's easy just yeah. kind of show up and do, but it's there's so many factors. And I love how you mentioned the environment because I'm a big proponent of cleaning out and auditing our environment. So be it our social environment with our friends and our social media environment. Mm -hmm. In which I tell folks, you got to purge your social media accounts. Like, get rid of all the tracks. Like, I'll tell folks, I will add you on Instagram, but best believe I will mute all your posts. I'm not going to say any of them. Yeah. Like, I love scrolling through Instagram through two scrolls, and I'm seeing, boom, I hit the end. Because the end of the day is, I, I want my Instagram to help push me and motivate me to do the tasks I want to get done for the day mm -hmm. and not distract me. And I'll be honest, like, I tried TikTok. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do some research. I'm going to go. I went there with an intention. I'm going to go to TikTok, do some research, see what's being done, and try to recreate some stuff. And I love 10 times out of 10, I got distracted for 45 minutes. So yeah, now I'm like, yeah. I can't do this. I, I had to delete the app. Okay. It, it, it sucks you in. It's okay. <laughs> so I think that some of people like, you know, because it's what you're saying is nothing new. Everyone said it before. Write your goal the night before. Be realistic with yourself. Don't lie to yourself. So set smart, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-based goals. We all know about the smart thing, but it's the only missing factor in all this is people just need to execute. Like, just do it. There's no... There's no, sh there's no tip. There's no secret. There's no trick. There's no go to bed with this scent on your pillow. There's no waking up at this ideal time. You just got to do it. <laughs> yeah. Just push yourself. Just go do it. And I'm a big believer in that. It's if your passion and your purpose of why you want to do is a true deep down to the core important to you, you're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. Like the countless stories of you know, someone, you know, I was kind of on my bad on, on like just kind of lazing around. But then, like, ever since I got my kid, I have to step up and get things done because I got to put food in their mouths. Yeah. That person found a purpose. And if you could find a way to tap into that same purpose, either artificially or just kind of make believing into ourselves and putting that energy into something else that we find important, we could all achieve what we want to achieve. Exactly. Exactly. It's a simple recipe, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> simple recipe. <laughs> awesome. All right, so we got the writing, we got the we got the PLA, we got a bit of the nanotechnology. So I'm curious, what's what's something that you're not working on now that you'd love to dive into? Like, you no, know, this thing down there looks really interesting, but I can't because my plate is full. But I really want to dive into that right now. Oh, that's a good question. Like a lot. Um, one thing that I am planning on going top five, top five. <laughs> Um, just the top five <laughs> okay i will i will say one but one thing that i really want to go deep into next year is artificial intelligence uh because i have like a sh very shallow uh knowledge in it right now but i feel like it's so impactful it's just going to be um so substantial in the future and it's really important to know about so i want to gain a technical depth in that um and you know i want to know like the different kinds of networks and how to leverage them and uh go a little bit deeper into coding because i'm not the greatest coder um and and just you know just just vibe with artificial intelligence that is a goal that i have um and it's also just such an interesting interesting topic and su such a big topic you know you can find something you're interested in within artificial intelligence because it is yes. enormous. Um, and so I'm excited. I'm excited to get into that. Yes. Yeah, like, can you talk about artificial intelligence? You have artificial intelligence for content writing. Yeah, You've got like artificial so intelligence for stores. You have artificial intelligence for your shopping patterns. Yeah. Yet, like there's artificial intelligence in any and everything we're tapping into. And I don't think people, like people have this idea of like the movie, I robot, the robot's going to take over. Like people don't realize like, no, like it's impossible for the robot to take over. Like it, they're not built that way. <laughs> it's not how it works. Like they're able to decipher certain things off of the patterns and kind of either guess what's going to happen next. But at the end of the day, they need it needs humans input to be able to function. And like when I'm thinking of artificial intelligence, like my main interest for artificial intelligence is just the way that it will help create. I'm not going to say create the way it will help alleviate people from having to do certain manual work that will allow them to then be created to do more things. Mm -hmm. And yes, I understand there are some people in the, out there in the world that don't have the privilege to be in that situation to benefit from that, which could also cause a situation of less jobs out there. But I'm, I'm right for this example, I want to choose to be in the position of like, right, if we're in the Western world and we have access to the internet technology, I'm thinking of the freedom we could get by automating certain tasks and skills and jobs to then be more creative and create more things. I do believe that once AI comes in, the speed of which society has been developing it's already been exponential. Mm -hmm. 
it'll be exponential on top of exponential at that point. Yeah. Exactly. How do you, how do you see things going in terms of, Marshall, again, you, you mentioned you're not too deep into the AI, but in terms of automation and, and just kind of helping with the tasks that you're working on right now, like, do you see automation at all coming in to help with nanotechnology, coming in to help with um, doing research for the microalgae, or even helping in with the solar energy and solar cells? Yeah, I think artificial intelligence is going to impact every single field of work. It's going to be huge. And it already is. Like, it already is starting to do these kinds of things. Um, in terms of, like, its specific applications within energy or nanotech, honestly, um, I don't know if I can speak too much to that, or at least accurately. Um, and so I'm not entirely sure exactly in the way, I mean, maybe in terms of research, um, I'm sure that it'll it'll come in with some automation there, but really as a whole, artificial intelligence will be game changing. Uh, and so I think it is important to know about and I think it will impact those fields as well. Most definitely. And people need not to be scared of artificial intelligence. It's your friend. <laughs> it's 100% your friend. <laughs> we use it every day, Google Maps. <laughs> All right, so now we've dived in a bit onto the projects you're working on. Now I'm curious to kind of dive in to learn a bit more about you and yourself and Nyla Malou. Right. So I'm curious to know in that if you could deliver a message to everybody around the world through push notification, what would that message read and why? Mm -hmm. That's a good question too. Um, I think I would say fail fast. Just those two words. Push notification out on Twitter. There you go. I think failure is too often viewed as a barrier, as a bad thing. Um, and that's, again, a narrative that society has created for this concept. But failure is very key to big projects that you're going to work on. If you're working to end world hunger, if you're working to solve one of the world's biggest problems, it's not going to be easy and there's going to be failure. But that is what is going to make it even better. Uh, and so instead of thinking of it like a barrier to success, think of it as, you know, something that is actually going to enable success. Um, and so I think that's just, it's, your tuition. Yeah, it's just, it's just not, it's just not um, viewed in uh, a good light right now. And it should be, maybe that's because of schools, like failure is considered like below a 50%. Um, and so everyone is so afraid of failure. But again, for, for these big kinds of things, you need to accept that failure is just going to happen and you need to be okay with it. Uh, you know, even become comfortable with embracing it. That is important. Fail fast. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. Fail fast. And I have to agree. Because when, so one thing I've learned, I've had a friend who was in circus school and he goes to me, Chris, when you're learning how to juggle, the first thing they teach you is how to drop the ball. And I'm like, what do you mean drop the ball? Like, dude. So the reason they teach you how to drop the ball is that once you know the many different ways that you're going to drop the ball, you then know how not to do that and how to prevent that from happening. And with as fast and one thing I keep is as fast as the world is moving now, there's no time for perfectionism. You got to just execute as fast as you can, get a minimum viable product out and see if it works. If it fails, find ways to improve upon it and build and build and grow and then get a proper product out. But if you just kind of wait for perfection to come out, someone's going to go blow right past you with your idea, run with it and take all the glory and highlight. And they're going to be seen as the one for being the innovator. Meanwhile, like, well, I had the idea, but if you never put it out and you never get that feedback, and learning what to improve upon, chasing perfection is just going to slow you down. Mm -hmm. No more time for perfection, ladies and gentlemen. No more time. Yeah. <laughs> but in talking about perfection, though, I'm curious to know, for you, Nyla, what does your perfect day look like? Oh, I like that question, too. Um, I think my perfect day. So I would wake up kind of early, like let's say 8 a.m. I think that is that is considered very early for me right now. Um, and <laughs> I would wake up, I would 
I would hang out with some friends. We would eat a nice brunch. We'd actually go for a picnic outdoors. You know, we'd go swimming. It would be a gorgeous day. Um, it would be great. And then um, we'd hang out. We'd hang out for a few hours. I'd come back home. Uh, and then I'd do a little bit of writing. I would do a little bit of cool research. Um, you know, hang out with my family. Go for a bike ride with my sister. We did that today. It was it was great. It was great. Um, you know, and then... You know, have a nice, have a nice dinner, have a nice dinner with a fam, maybe sit down for a movie, um, maybe a documentary for feeling spicy, we'll see, um, uh, and go to bed at, like, 11. That would be a great day. That would be a fun day. Sounds fun. Sounds good. Yeah. That sounds like a, a that sounds very much like a doable day. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like that. And he's, I just talk about documentaries. Have you ever heard of Curiosity Stream or Nebula? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, oh, all right, Nyla, Nyla, Nyla. Whoo! All right. So you're familiar with you're familiar with Netflix, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. So this is Curiosity Stream and Nebula are the Netflix of documentaries of like Earth shows, nature shows, travel shows, but all done with creators that are actually putting time and effort into it, not just some quick massive production. Mm-hmm. These are creators that are doing things through love and passion. Mm-hmm. And it's as cheap as like a dollar something a month to get access to both. And it's honestly like, I'm not a big, like I cut away Netflix maybe seven, eight years ago. Oh. And ever since I got, I got curiosity stream in December and it's the, other than that on YouTube, those are the only two things I really watch, but definitely check out, I'll send you a link afterwards. Curiosity stream. They're not sponsoring the show. I just like the product. It's phenomenal. And if you love documentaries as much as I love documentaries, you're going to geek out on this thing and just go gangbusters right. crazy on this thing. Sounds good. We'll check it out. Perfect. And one thing I also realized is you mentioned hanging out with your friends. And I didn't get a chance to ask you, but I'm curious to know, how does it feel or how have you navigated having, because essentially you you have two worlds you're dealing with right now. You got your peers that are your age that you hang out with, that you have your fun with. But then when you're, when you got to put on this like science hat, you're dealing with what I'm assuming is generally a bunch of older people. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to assume that at the beginning, it probably felt a bit awkward and weird going in at first. Like I'm talking to someone who's three times my age about something, but how do you, <laughs> how do you navigate between both worlds going back and forth? Um, I mean, I don't really think of it like two different worlds. Um, it's kind of just all in one, one fun world. It's a good time. Um, so, you know, go to school, hang out with your friends. It's a good time. And then come home go on a few calls with like some experts in certain fields where you just want to learn more about a specific topic. Uh, It it doesn't really feel like a divide for me. Uh, It just feels like one fun, great place, you know? Um, And maybe at the beginning, going on calls with experts was a little weird because I'd never really done it before. And I wasn't always comfortable with holding you know call but now it's something that i actually find really fun and i love i love meeting new people um you know regardless regardless of age and so it's great it's great i love hanging out with a variety of different people um you know doing a variety of different things i like that i like that and it definitely sounds like you're just you're just being you at the end of the day like it's like, I've heard it over and over time, it's just like, man, that's really cool. I want to dive into it. I'm like, that just sounds like someone who's generally interested. It's not like I'm trying to make this image. I'm like, I'm generally interested in this thing. And that's, I'm loving that love of curiosity. And it's something that I feel, as people age, we tend to lose that curiosity for things. Because, like, you know, society beats down on us, figure that one thing, go to work, get a job, da 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 But I find once you keep that childlike curiosity in things, you're, like, the happiest person in the world. Because everything's new. Everything's exciting. Everything's fresh. And it forces you to see things in a different lens that others don't necessarily see. Yeah. So whatever you do, keep that curiosity keep going. Curiosity. And it helps you stay young too. Like you don't age fast. That, that's the <laughs> that's my secret for anti-aging. <laughs> stay curious and laugh a lot. <laughs> All right, so I'm talking about failing. I want you to finish this next sentence. If I knew I couldn't fail, I would. I would fly to Silicon Valley and just go to a bunch of people's doors and say, hey, do you want to go for coffee? That's what I would do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> 
coffee. I like that. It's something that's not as professional, more casual. You know. Easy you environment. You build a relationship first. You build a relationship first. Oh. <laughs> I like how you're thinking there, Nyla. I like how you're thinking. Build the relationship first. Figure out what value you could add to them. Then bring up that value that you could add to them. And then from their relationship blossoms and you get whatever you wanted from them. And you both build and grow together. It's good. Good time. Symbiosis. I got to say, I tip my hat off to you for figuring that one out. Because most people don't figure <laughs> that, that part of the recipe out is really build a relationship, give value, and then you get what you want at the end of it. Was this something that you learned through child and error? Or is this like a secret like your mom and dad passed down to you at a young age? Like, Nyla, this is the secret? <laughs> And just go. Um, I don't know. I don't really know exactly who I learned it from. Probably a combination of different things. Um, like my parents, school, and all society. You know, it all came together. And that is where my morals and beliefs have come from. So, yeah. Maybe that's just just a merging. Merging of those. <laughs> just a blend of it all. Just like, you're just like one big pot of just stuff coming in. Just mix it all in. And we got a little outcome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Sorry, right, Nyla. We're about to dive into lightning round. Okay. So lightning round is real simple. Is this or that style of questions? Think quickly. Don't ponder too long on an answer. Just say what comes to mind first. Are you ready? Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. There we go. That's that energy I want here. Not an okay. I don't want no timidness. I want a assertive okay. All right. Let's get ready. Question one. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. TV shows or movies? TV shows. What's worse, doing laundry or dishes? Dishes. Iced coffee or hot coffee? Iced coffee. Would you rather be rich or famous? Uh, famous. No, rich. No, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> famous. No. It's okay. Yeah. Nothing yeah, wrong with being no famous. Being okay. Famous. Well, don't let people, society pressure you on that. You're allowed to be famous. It's okay. <laughs> Would you rather be the passenger or a driver? Passenger. And the final one is horror movie or comedy? comedy. Immediately. Yeah. All, right, like all, right, all right. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> not a fan of getting scared and jumping out of your chair? Yeah. No, that's not a neat thing. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. So you mentioned you had siblings. How many siblings do you have? One. My sister. She is two years older than me. Okay. Is she into the same things as you are? Um, she's also very much into STEM. Um, and so right now she's looking to like piezo electricity and also a little bit of nanotechnology. Um, and then she's doing some internship at a consulting firm right now as well. So, you know, definitely like different interests, but around the same same big big topics you know okay okay so i got a, a random question here for you so in your family who do you think would last the longest in a zombie apocalypse um, my sister yeah she's a queen ah. she's a queen she's all a right queen. all right all right yeah. got a little badassness yeah, in you there too yeah she she's about it <laughs> All right, Nyla, so I'd like to end this episode with asking all my guests this one question. It's a question I love, mainly for my selfish reasons of learning other dope people and dope stories to learn about. And the question is, if you could have a dinner guest over, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I would go to dinner with Melinda Gates because she is an icon. Um, the work that she's doing is incredible. I love watching her speeches. She's so motivational. She's all for, like... Women in STEM, you know, girl power. She honestly seems like she would be a, a great person to have dinner with. And she's just so down to earth and humble as well. Um, you know, it would be a fun time. It would be a fun time. Um, and so I think Melinda Gates, definitely one of the people I look up to for sure. Okay. And what would you make her for dinner? Oh, I'm making dinner? Okay. Um, well, yeah, yeah you're invited. <laughs> she's your dinner guest. Um, yeah, <laughs> I would order food. Because if I did not, I would likely poison her. But I could make a pizza, you know, a freezer pizza. That is my capability. I'm a really bad cook, 
I can bake, but I cannot cook. So, you know, maybe we'd order something <laughs> for dinner, and then I would bake her some nice cookies, you know? <laughs> but not, not a good girl. So, yeah, it's bad. Okay. I, I, I like the honesty. Yeah, working on it. Cooking's not very <laughs> gross. <you know? laughs> Cook- <laughs> we only have 24 hours to learn many the things in life, good. right? Like cooking wasn't, <laughs> didn't take a priority. <laughs> All right, and the final thing I'm curious about is, it's a new question I keep forgetting to ask, and I only brought up at the end, is pretty much what is in your news feed? So what is in your news feed is what is something you've seen within the past few days in your news feed that really caught your attention? Mm. So I think like maybe five days ago, I watched Seaspiracy, um, the documentary, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely insane. And so I followed, like, um, the person who created it and, like, some of the platforms um, there. And then um, over the past, like, few days, a lot of things on my feed have been surrounding fish. And I never really realized their importance and what is happening to them, but it's insane. Like, we need them. Otherwise, we will have these dead oceans. And there is so much crime going on with fish. They're just being treated so horribly, just slaughtered uh, for us to eat. And um, it's honestly, it was scary. It was scary to watch that documentary because I didn't even realize um, the the implications. And so that has been blowing up on my LinkedIn. Um, and I think it's it's very important to know about. Not comfortable, but important. Okay, and this is CSEA Spiracy? Yeah. Okay, dope. I'm yeah, gonna put that on the list to check a, out. That sounds. Sea spiracy noted. Yeah. Perfect, Nyla. I want to say thank you for sharing time with me. I appreciate you taking time out of your day and jumping me on this dope, dope podcast. So, Nyla, where could the family and fans find you to connect with you and learn more about you? Yeah, so you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or just connect there. Um, I have a website. I'm on Twitter. I'm not as active on Twitter, so I think best bet would be LinkedIn. <laughs> Perfect. And what is uh, what is your website? It's just nylamulu.com. N-A-I-L-A-M-O-L-O-O.com. Nice. You heard it here, ladies and gentlemen. So, right, family. So, once again, another dope episode of Next Gen Fridays. And again, if you're feeling any questions about what you need to do in life or how to go about things getting done, just write it down. Set your goals of the night before. And just execute on them. As easy as that. All right, family. You have yourself an awesome rest of the day. Peace out.